thank you. Uh, I've been told that I'm croaking today because I have a cold. Uh, if you can't hear me or I seem to fade out, wave or do something. Push the mic right close to your mouth. There you go. That's pretty close. <laughs> uh, I couldn't help but uh, share this particular slide that we have right here. Uh, it symbolizes what has been for a very long time, which is what's happened to them. They've flown the coop, and we're talking about huge areas where they're missing. Uh, a recent tagging study by Shelley Talek involved Canadian, American, and nonprofit uh, institutions found that the whole northern crest of the Gulf of Maine didn't have any fish, any cod fish. And uh, when you look at it, uh, you can see that the watersheds of Maine's major rivers exactly fit the area where there are no fish. And when I saw that, I said, oh, it's got to be a predator-prey situation between diatomous fish like alewives and cod. But wait a minute. The alewives and herring all migrate south in the winter. So the only thing left is their young of year. Yikes. Could that biomass be significant enough so that uh, it would attract codfish all along our coast? There's some real question marks there. This guy, Commissioner Baird, said, uh, post-Civil War said that's exactly what happened when dams closed off the major rivers along the New England coast and eliminated basically the whole species. And I looked at it and said, well, uh, there are undoubtedly examples of that more recently if he was right. And if he was right, then one of the reasons why we don't have any codfish around here could be we're missing certain prey species. So I looked and uh, there was one area, Muscongas Bay, that had alewives running in it. Uh, actually still do. But in the early 60s, uh, right at the peak of the sardine industry, uh, the run of codfish in Muscungus Bay disappeared. Now, if you just look at it uh, as one little uh, uh, one little spot in uh, uh, along the coast, Muscungus Bay isn't much. It's sandwiched between the Kennebec and the Penobscot river systems, but uh, it was part of four small subpopulations, uh, four small spawning groups that made up these mid-coast subpopulations. And uh, there it is up there. And uh, you can see each of those spawning groups had their own particular uh, spawning grounds. So I said, well, <clears throat> maybe if I, if I uh, took the coastal trial survey results, I could identify where young of year LYs were located at. So I did. And uh, these are the general areas where fingerling LYs ended up in the fall. What I found is at the same time, there were quite a few herring that showed up there as well. Young of the year herring and, and uh, small uh, juveniles. As a matter of fact, 2001 to 2005, there were roughly twice as many alewives as there were herring. And uh, from 2005 to 2010, there were two and a half, almost three times as many herring as there were alewives. But the number of alewives stayed about the same. <coughs> Interesting. The question is, where were the cod when the cod was still there? Well, we knew certain things. One thing we knew is that cod 
reproduced here according to 1930s to 1950s uh, fishermen uh, that I interviewed back in the mid-90s. Uh, good. Guess what? When you superimpose those spawning grounds in the locations of where those uh, uh, fingerling alewives and herring were located, it was the same place. Um, it was a shock to me as well, and uh, clearly suggests that there needs to be some field research done to confirm what is this very, very interesting connection. I took my historical database, which goes back to the 20s, and decided to see what happened if I plotted the movement of codfish during that time period. Here's what I found. Now, in order to establish predation, you've got to establish shared, uh, they have to be at the same place at the same time. That certainly showed it. But at the same time, you have to either show gut analyses or have a proxy for predation. And I said, well, there are no such things as gut analyses of cod from Muscungus Bay in the 1920s, so I cooked up a proxy, which was if codfish were attracted by the prey there, every other predator in the area was going to join them. And I had the database for uh, not only cod, it included haddock, Pollock and White Haig, so I plotted their distribution patterns as well. This talk is too short for me to show you the extra four slides, so I skimmed them. But they all moved to that same, those same two locations. Now, that's a 1920s database, a 1930s to 50s database, and recent distribution patterns for uh, small pelagics database and they all identified the same location it's like yeah right they're gone all of those species the northern coastal shelf has been without ground fish for 20 odd years Yikes. does that mean it's the end of the fishery if we come to the bitter end <coughs> multi-century business that we all, of the, all of us that we're enjoying it, really enjoy. I think that's true, only if we ignore the obvious. Here's some of the obvious that you can't ignore. In the 1870s, cod disappeared from the shore following a dramatic reduction in prey. 1960s, the same thing happened in Muscungus Bay. In the 1990s, <coughs> Jeffrey's Bank, the same thing happened with a dramatic reduction in the, actually it was primarily the Penobscot Bay spawning group of Heron. Um, but here's the reality today. We have removed dams from the three major rivers in northern New England. They are going to produce buku fingerlings. They are going to be back at the mouths of those rivers on those inshore grounds, which hasn't hosted predator species of groundfish for many years. Uh, the Kennebec is already up and going. It's up to three, a little over three million. The Penobscot will top out 10 to 12 million, and the, the uh, St. Croix on the other end, they're projecting as a possible 14 million adults each year. This is going to create an enormous biomass of fingerling sized prey near in the general vicinity of those, uh, those two systems, three systems. Here's the areas that are going to experience the benefit, uh, such as it might be, of having literally billions of fingerling alewives reintroduced into coastal waters. My goodness, 
those are the same areas where we don't have any fish today. This could be really good for us old Comanchean fishermen, and I look forward to it. So that we can have a little more of this. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Thank you very much.